All right, this Hangout on Air is live. This is going to be part one of the collision material. I'm going to wait a little bit for people to join and to confirm that they're getting in and can hear what I'm saying. I also have to do some tab cleanup. Uh, so let me just do that. Right, I've just dropped into IRC to see if there's anything important happening there. Um, right. Um, okay, as far as I can tell, people are in and are getting something. Yeah, okay, uh, there are confirmation links that the, the YouTube link that I posted is working for people, so I'm going to assume that that's now fine. And switch back to my lecture tab and have a look at the Hangout tab. Um, there are only, what, seven viewers in the Hangout, which is a little bit disappointing. Maybe the number's not accurate or... Uh, something okay it's creeping up a little bit so this is i'll do my usual I'll, i'm sitting about while people are coming into the class oh you know i haven't got any red bull i want to go and get some red bull Right, nearly there. <clears throat> 14 viewers, wonderful. And okay. <laughs> right, people are in and saying sarcastic things in the uh, in the IRC, so uh, it's time to chat then. Right, settle down, everyone, settle down, quiet. All right, let's see if I can do this. Bloody hell. Today we're going to talk about collision. Uh, right. Collision is a serious business, it certainly is. And to illustrate that, here is a important public service announcement about uh, why collisions are an important part of all our lives. Now, the frame rate of this stream is probably not great, so this might get distorted a bit, but we can always use it as a baseline reference, so I will play it. King Canute tried to defy the forces of gravity by insisting he could turn back the tides. Today we laugh at the absurd monarch, but are we really any better than he? Hi, I'm Greg Evigan, Robert Russo in TV's Pacific Palisades. If you've ever wondered what happens when things fall over, spill, or get knocked out of cupboards, then join me now and see what they are. When things get knocked over, spill, or fall out of cupboards. This week, be true. Again. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, just going to make Timmy's tea. The usual 
Access Day special, sardines on toast and a waitrose boots. And, well, I'd had a few drinks. Well, it's coming up to six o'clock. I reached up to uh, the top cupboard and I accidentally knocked one of my beetroot jars on Tim's head. <laughs> He's always getting in the way under the feet. Anyway, we hit it and boom, bang onto the floor. Boom. Boom. And it was, let me tell you, it was very odd because I, I looked at him for a moment lying there and I, and I thought to myself, I really hope he's dead. I hope he's dead. <laughs> I started laughing. And thinking that would be the one thing that would really upset his mother and little <laughs> Margaret standing there <laughs> crying over his grave. <laughs> anyway, um, Tim got up and sat down and was fit as a pie. It was a very strange moment for me, really. Cute. Peter. Peter Norman and Tim Gibbs Norman thought that they too could defy gravity like a pair of stupid canutes. But tiny Tim Gibbs Norman's beetroot battered head bears mute witness to the unstoppable forces that are unleashed when some beetroot combines with the force of gravity and then becomes one of the things that get knocked over, spill, or fall out of cupboards. I'm Greg Evergan. Goodbye. I made this. Um, I should perhaps explain that was a comedy sketch, uh, a parody of those kind of cheap, crappy, you know, when sharks and bees attack type documentaries that used to get made. Anyway, <clears throat> so collision. There are two big parts of dealing with collisions in a, a simulation. Firstly, you have to be able to detect collisions. And then once you've done that, you need to be able to handle the consequences. So the first part of that, detecting collisions, is just geometry, really. And the second part is physics. So let's talk about detection. So as you probably realise intuitively, when you're detecting a collision, what you're trying to do is, is work out whether the volume uh, described by some set of objects has got any overlap in it, in the virtual space that they exist in. This can uh, you know, be in 2D, 3D, however many D you've got. And in fact, if you're being accurate about it, it's not just the overlap of the shapes, it's the overlaps of the extrusion of those shapes over time, but we'll talk about that a bit later on. That's uh, a, bit, a bit tricky. Um, so, if you've got these collision volumes that are the, you know, the, the, the sh that represent the space that is filled by the shape, and you represent that by geometric primitives of the standard types that's listed here, triangles, circles, or in 3D spheres, rectangles, or cuboids. This just becomes maths. You just take all these shapes and work out whether there's any overlap between them. For the handling part, that's the physics side of it, where having detected that some things have overlapped, you now have to make that not happen anymore by applying forces in a real system. This is done by creating actually impulses, kind of instantaneous pushes that resolve the collision and would push apart the objects that would have otherwise overlapped. But there are, there are easier ways. There's a kind of brute force things you can do where you just, you know, uh, displace the objects from each other to stop them colliding. How far you go in that depends on how fancy your physics system is. And up till now, we've had very simple physics, essentially kind of linear point motion stuff. So what we've been doing with collisions is we respond to them by negating one of the components of the velocity, either the x or the y component, depending on whether it was a uh, whether it hit a vertical or a horizontal obstruction. And if you were paying attention in the breakout lecture, you can see you can generalize generalize that a little bit to do angle of incidence equals angle of reflection type stuff. Uh, so that's another type of handling you can apply. But there's a kind of question, a higher level question on top of both of those, which is about 
how to actually integrate all of this stuff into your main loop. You know, you know that you need to detect the collisions and do something about them, but well, where do you do the detection logic and how do you react and uh, how do you tie all this in together with the update behavior that you've already got? Well, there's a standard sort of default naive way of doing that, which is uh, to just have the main loop work the way as it's always uh, been working. You just go through each entity, update them in turn as part of your uh, update of what would now be your entity manager loop. And then, once you've done all that updating, make another sweep over all the objects to look for uh, collisions that have occurred between them, right? Okay. So that approach is quite honest and is a nice separation of concerns. You say, okay, right, I move things and then I detect collisions and you know, it seems kind of natural. The other good thing about this uh, approach is that it's sort of consistent with the idea that even though we updated the objects one at a time in some order, by doing all the updates before we resolve any of the collisions, it's, it makes it more as if the objects had all moved simultaneously, which is closer to what we're trying to achieve. So that's nice, it's a good separation of concerns, it deals with simultaneity quite well, this seems like an attractive approach. Detecting the collisions is just geometry, which you know, there are some equations, you have to figure them out or uh, read about them in books or the internet. And indeed, this technique of having a sort of two-pass system, where you do the updates and then the collision resolution, that's what Grand Theft Auto did in the early part of its development, way back in the Dark Ages. And as you'll maybe realize, if you've been following the dramatic structure of this lecture, there's a problem with doing it this way. The problem is when it comes to the next step of doing your collision resolution, where you respond to the collisions that you've detected. Because if you've moved all the objects first, then all those objects are in new provisional positions before you start trying to resolve the collisions. Well, that means it can become very difficult to figure out what to do if a collision actually has occurred, as I will try to explain. Your collision response system wants to stop interpenetrations from actually happening. The idea is you've detected that some interpenetration would have occurred, and in the real world that doesn't happen, right? Solid objects aren't allowed to go inside each other, normally speaking. So the resolution process has to somehow figure out a way to put those two objects to be in separated positions, obviously. And you've got to do that by moving one or the other of them, or maybe both. And you also have to move them to unoccupied space, otherwise you're just, you're just, uh, you're just spreading the problem out. So where do you move these colliding objects to? Well, it's hard to know. One thing you could do is you could say, take the intersecting, intersecting objects and uh, you know, work out how much they overlap by and just make them repel each other by such an amount that they are separated from each other. You could, you could draw a line between the center points of the two objects, measure the distance of overlap and push them apart along that line and that would sort of separate them naturally. But what if in the course of doing that, the things that you've moved end up bumping into something else. Uh, and what if that something else is a static obstruction, like a wall? If it moves into the wall, the wall can't move out of its way. So that's not good. Uh, and if it moves into a dynamic entity, like another part of your simulation, it's like, well, now you've got another collision to resolve where you have to kind of iterate through this process. Now, if you're lucky, that might eventually resolve into something satisfactory but it's hard to know that it definitely will, especially if you get objects that sort of overlap with each other in a tight environment where everything is squeezing up against the walls, where it's, it's, you haven't got a lot of freedom to move them out of the way. Yeah, so walls, walls can't move away, and even other objects, if you end up colliding with them, then they collide with something else, and they collide with something else, this can go on for a while. So what you really want to do is if you detect a collision would have happened, just go back to where you were before. And that's what we've been doing all along in the course. In fact, if you remember Pong, if we detect that there would have been a collision, we just keep the ball back 
at its previous position before it had moved at all. And that's that's a little bit wrong because it's it means that it bounces slightly prematurely, but it does mean that it's bouncing from a safe place. But of course, if you move all the objects simultaneously or pseudo simultaneously, you can't guarantee that that previous position is still unoccupied because someone else might have moved into it. So now you don't have this safe place to go back to. Now that doesn't happen terribly often, but the point is it can happen. And even if it's quite a rare thing, eventually it will happen. And, uh, and you'll have some horrible pathological case where you know, all of your entities get in a kind of pile up and they can't revert to their previous possessions and the whole thing becomes a horrible mess. And this is a real nightmare scenario. And indeed this happened in GTA. Uh, during development we had these scenarios where you could have like a whole bunch of cars all piled up closely in an almost circular formation and then someone could nudge into that from the outside and trigger a bunch of collisions. The response to each of those was that each car would try and revert to its previous position which was now occupied by the car behind it in the queue which would then cascade back to the one before it and before it and if they happened to be in like a circular or a semi you know pseudo circular configuration this would actually become potentially an infinite loop and it was a nightmare and there were all sorts of horrible nasty hacks that were being done to try and work around it but the whole thing was just fundamentally not good. So the results could be uh, pretty nasty. And I think this is an interesting example of uh, good intentions gone wrong. Because what had happened here was a fairly natural bit of problem decomposition. Now, I'm not quite sure what the fashions are in teaching you software design techniques at the moment, but one of the classic ones is just stepwise refinement, where you take your big difficult problem, decompose it into smaller, simpler problems, and just keep going until you can find problems that you can solve. In principle, this separation of updates and collisions is like that and is the same thing to do until you realize that you've given yourself an incredibly hard problem to solve by doing it that way. And what you have to realize is that sometimes it becomes apparent that you've made the wrong decomposition because you've got a problem that is really hard. And the thing to do there is to back out and re rethink your assumptions and see if, well, maybe I should just have decomposed this problem a different way such that it wouldn't be such a a nasty uh, scenario. So just to remind you, the central problem we have is that it would be nice if in the case of a collision, things would move back to some safe place and you want that safe place. Well, the obvious candidate is the previous position that they were in, but that won't work if someone else has moved into your position. So there's a very simple way of fixing this. And I believe it's now the standard one that people use. And that's simply to give up on the apparently simultaneous updates. You want to be able to guarantee that the object's previous location is a safe place to go back to. And the only way to do that is to move each object one at a time. So what you have to do now is change your update loop so that you move a thing check whether it would have collided, and if it has, you can bring it back to the position it started in, which is definitely a safe place because it was just there uh, you know, a fraction of a second ago. But this is wrong. Uh, if you do it this way, it does violate the assumption that everything in your simulation moves simultaneously. It means you go back to a kind of chess piece model where each thing is actually moving one at a time, and that is detectable. You know, you get different results depending on the order in which you choose to iterate through your entity list. And that's unfortunate, but I think in this case it's the lesser evil because it lets you avoid the nightmare scenarios. But it is true that it now means that the collision between two objects will depend slightly on the order in which you updated them. Luckily, Games have to be running at fairly high frame rates anyway to be any good. And at those sort of rates, the kind of time units that we're talking about are 
you know, things like 16 milliseconds or less. And it turns out if there's an anomaly along those kind of time scales, that's too small for people to notice. So uh, it's another one of these little things where we cheat. I've kind of mentioned this before, the idea if you had a game where you were had two cars or something racing each other and they were completely neck and neck even, that the system is going to detect one of them crossing the line slightly before the other one arbitrarily. And it's sort of the same thing with uh, collision. So it's arbitrary, it's unfair, it's wrong, and it's the recommended solution. <laughs> that's, just, that's just the way it is. So this does make collision response a much easier, more tractable problem. It means that, you know, when in doubt, go back to your previous position and you can sort of rely on the fact that that will always work. You don't have to have a hundred crazy special cases to deal with things being squashed up against walls and, uh, you know, constrained on all sides and with nowhere to move out of all these horrible things that you would otherwise struggle with. Uh, of course... <laughs> That would be true as long as the environment itself is not dynamic. If you've got moving platforms and stuff, then this all gets a bit harder because even your safe places are kind of dynamic. Um, you just have to be very careful about that if you're doing it, and I'm not going to uh, elaborate on it here. But I'm going to elaborate a bit on the details of the geometry of performing uh, collision detection. So that's what we'll talk about now. So you take your game objects and you wrap them up in kind of simplified geometric primitives, like circles and rectangles and things, and then you check whether those, those primitives uh, overlap each other. So for each entity in your simulation, you have what's uh, sometimes called a collision model or a collision volume, which is the simplified version of that shape that is used by the collision detection system. So for example, in a 3D game, you know, your character might be a very highly detailed thousand polygon model, but you don't use that as the collision volume, it would be too slow. What you do instead is you, you wrap it up with simplified volumes, you know, just spheres and boxes and stuff, and, uh, and that makes the collision process a lot easier to compute. So it's an approximation. And that's simply because using the fully detailed form would be very slow and actually quite complex. And the time that you save from the simplification is, is worth the slight, the slight coarseness that you get for the collisions being uh, not perfect. So for example, some entities you might be able to just wrap them up in a simple rectangular box or something. On other occasions, you might have to create a slightly more complicated thing, but it, it, it rarely gets highly complicated. So there's an example. I'm not sure if my mouse position is picked up in these captures, so I should have tried to check that. But uh, in the center of this image, there's the spaceship, which is, you know, I mean, this isn't high poly by today's standards, but that used, that, that used to be a high poly model. Um, and it's surrounded by two very simple rectangular, uh, sort, of, sort of cuboidal shapes that serve as the collision boundaries. Even your collision volumes, though, uh, if they get too complicated, that can cause its own set of problems, especially if, uh, you know, for example, if you just allow the artist to define the collision volumes around an object, you might find that they want to make it very tight fitting and accurate, but in so doing, they end up having to use lots of collision uh, volumes or collision primitives, and that's something you have to keep an eye on to stop it getting excessive. Ah, and the chat is telling me that they can see the mouse. That's cool. Thank you, chat people. So, um, so we're now dealing with the idea that maybe you've got multiple collision volumes on your shape. And as I was just saying, that can be slow after a while. So there's one standard thing that's done on top of all of this, which is you wrap up all the collision shapes in one outer very simple shape the idea being that you can use that to compute an early rejection case for
for the common case where things are not colliding with each other. So all it is is you take the, the collision volume that you actually want and you put a big sphere on the outside of it that wraps up the whole thing. And that way, if the sphere doesn't collide with anything, you know that none of the stuff inside it does. And that's called a, a bounding volume. So the collision volume is the internal shape and the bounding volume is this simple wrapper. Yeah, and the, the type of shape you use for that is uh, boxes and spheres, typically, because they're among the geometrically simplest. So here's an example of that. This is a little video by a guy who I think is just like making his own homebrew engine. And uh, if you look here, you'll see that that's the wireframe model of a sphere that is used as, as, as a, a bounding volume around his building. And if you just play this, you'll see a bit more of what's going on. Now, I don't think there's supposed to be any audio here, so don't worry about the fact that you're not hearing any. Okay, so there's a bounding sphere with a couple of collision cuboids inside it, representing the inner shape. So the idea is that anything that was moving around and collision checking with that, if it's outside the sphere, which is an easy check, you just know straight away there's no collision. And it's only if you go inside the sphere that it then has to do more detailed checks against these inner volumes, which are you know, a slightly more complicated thing. So that's so that you get reasonably high quality of collision if you actually go right inside the, the object. So this is the kind of thing you would see in a, a game editor you know, if you were working on a uh, working on authoring content for your game engine, you you tend to have views like that. So that was three D um, because I thought it was interesting to show it, but we also care about two D, especially for the kind of things that we're we're making. And the two D equivalent of these spheres and cuboids are just rectangles and circles. Sometimes a 2D game might have pixel perfect collision on the sprites. That's occasionally done on platform games if they want to be really accurate, but it's not very common. And that's done in a kind of different way that I'm not going to talk about, so I won't, but I'll just let you know that there are alternatives. But I'm going to stick with the, the geometry based solutions. So, first thing we've got circles. And circles are a popular choice in these things as, uh, as collision primitives. Because, because they're easy to write collision detection for. And that use of a circle might seem lazy. In fact, it absolutely is lazy, but, uh, but it's kind of intelligent laziness because easy solutions have a tendency to be fast, concise, elegant, reliable, and those are all virtues. So it can sometimes make sense to aim for simplicity. So I'll show you some code for actually doing that. Now you might want to have a little think as to how you would check whether two circles had collided with each other. You sort of imagine it in your head. You can maybe see how it should be done. Um, if you think about the two, the centers of the two circles and the difference, the relationships between their, their radii and the distance between them. So what happens is that if the distance between the center points of the two circles is less than the sum of their radii, then that means they have, they have overlapped. And the code for that is very simple. So assume that we've got circle one and circle two, we've got center and radius properties. We work out the distance between the centers, fine. And there's an implied limit, the safety limit, which would be the radius of the first one plus the radius of the second one. And if the distance is less than the limit, it's a collision. Otherwise, it's not. And that's how you do circle to circle collision. Or at least that's how you could do it. But you can also do this. Uh, well, we'll get to that on the next slide. 
So, um, so this is easy, but when we're computing the distance between two things, we've had to use Pythagoras, right? You have to work out the difference in the x's, the difference in the y's, square both of them, add them together, take a square root. And uh, the thing to listen to there is take a square root. Now, historically, square roots were a slow thing on computers. That's less true nowadays, um, but it, it used to be a big concern to avoid square roots, and people tend to still try to avoid them almost for historical reasons. And so it's, it's true that square roots are not as expensive as they used to be, but if you can avoid them, it's still better to not do them than to do them, usually. So I'll show you what the, the workaround for that is. You square both sides of the inequality so that you can cancel out the need to do the square roots and everything else still works. We actually hinted this a little bit way back in uh, the early JavaScript lectures with the uh, the is prime thing, where uh, if you were clever, you could avoid doing the square root. Same sort of trick. When you see square roots, have a look at whether you can just square both sides and uh, you might come out ahead. So this is very similar to the last one, but instead of computing the distance, which is what you thought you wanted to know, you actually compute the distance squared, which is an easier thing to compute because it avoids the square root. And you just and do have your variable names be honest about things like this though. You know, if it's not the distance, don't call it the distance, admit that it's the square of the distance. But now, when you do the limit, the limit is just the square of the sum of the radii. So you're having to do a multiply in here, but you're saving a square root in there. And that's usually going to be a win. And the rest of the logic is the same. So that's, I think that's almost always how it's done in practice. Maybe a few people are, are would still would still do the square root and maybe compare that to other ways of doing it, but this is very uh, standard. Okay, so that was circles. Let's talk about rectangles. In particular, axis-aligned rectangles. So it's just you know uh, non-rotated rectangles. Yeah, so I, I would call them axis-aligned rectangles, but it's very common to describe them as axis-aligned bounding boxes, and that's abbreviated to AABB, so that's a thing to watch out for, use of that term. And when you, when you call it this, it, you're kind of generalizing. You can be talking about 2D or 3D if you're talking about an AABB. What's the code for that? Well... Again, you may want to think about it a bit. Imagine you had two rectangles and you wanted to work out whether they overlap. How do you do it? Um, if, if we were in class, I would ask you if you had any ideas and you wouldn't. So let's just skip that and we'll, we'll go straight to the answer. Yeah. So the, the way you start thinking about it is to sort of realize that... Um, it's easy to rule out cases where two rectangles don't overlap because there's like a clear separation between them. And it turns out you, you do it by exclusion. You check for the various ways that they might not be overlapping. And if all of those are true, then they're not. But if any of them are false, then you have got a collision. I'll show you. So this is some uh, a little demo that actually illustrates how it's done. And if I switch over here, you should hopefully be able to see the, the new tab. I think this will work. Right, so here we have two rectangles A and B, and you can actually move them about and stuff. And let's assume that they weren't overlapping. Well, so like that. So one of the ways for them to not overlap is if the you know the 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 lowest x position of this guy is higher than the largest x position of this guy. Yeah, because there's a clear gap here. That's one of the ways that they might fail, and that's that failing there. That's you normally expect if they were overlapping, A A's x2 coordinate should be greater than B's x1 coordinate, which it now is. So it's true. But if that's not true, then they can't possibly be overlapping. Therefore, that's not true. Therefore, the whole thing's not true. Another way to come at this is that when rectangles are overlapping, what's the form of the overlap? Well, the form of the overlap is another little rectangle in here. And what's the width of that rectangle? Well, it's the section that's common to this guy and this guy. It's the you know the part that they both belong to. 
and the y uh, height of the overlap is of course again the common section. So you can look at these inequalities as being attempts to sort of identify whether those overlaps exist and if any of them don't it's not a collision. So we did this one here where you fall out at the right hand side so now this x is bigger than the other x and it's not true. Uh, if you go down the other direction a similar thing happens in y so the y1 value here is going to become greater than the other guy, sorry, yeah, greater than the other guy's y2, yeah, which means that this constraint is no longer true. So you're false. You failed on that side, and you failed on that side, or you might fail on the top, or you might fail on the left, or you know various uh, sort of combinations of that. Um, and that's basically how you do it. So you, you just perform these four F checks, and if any of them are false, it means that your two shapes are definitely that there's there's clear air between them, therefore you don't have a collision. And as soon as there is some overlap, you do have one. So that's how that works. Right, so this is the last slide of this part of the lecture, you might be relieved to know. Um, <clears throat> So we've looked at circle to circle and rectangle to rectangle, but rectangle to circle is an interesting case and one of course that we, you can see you might care about, and of course you do care about it in things like Pong and Breakout, strictly speaking. So it's a little bit harder than the two that I've shown you, but there are some things you can do. One obvious thing you can do is if the circle is small enough, you can just wrap the circle up in a box and treat it like two boxes. That won't be completely accurate, but again, for many purposes, it's good enough. So if we go over here and we imagine instead that we have like a, a circle here, well, you take that circle and just wrap what would be a square. But I, I can't resize these, unfortunately, so I can't illustrate it. But if you had a circle here, you could wrap it up in a square and then check the square against the rectangle. And that would be, that would be nearly right. In particular, if the two things don't overlap, then it's definitely not a collision. And if the circle really did overlap with the, the square, with the rectangle, you would detect it. But of course, there's a mid-ground that would be, in a case like this perhaps, where you know the circle uh, doesn't actually overlap with the rectangle, but the bounding volumes do, and that's when you would get a kind of premature hit detection. But often that's not the worst thing in the world. So that's potentially acceptable. We've got some links here that talk about this in more detail. I won't go through them, but I've put them here so you can peruse them yourself if you really care. So this is a reasonable account of how to deal with a circle rectangle collision. If you think about it, you imagine taking a circle and running it around the outside of a rectangle as close as it could get, but not quite colliding. What you end up with is a kind of rounded rectangle. And one way to think about it is you want to check whether the centre of the circle is anywhere within this rounded rectangle which is mostly like an ordinary rectangle, except in the corners you have to do a bit of extra extra checking to curve the corners, which is what some of this stuff down here is doing. That's working out those corner cases. But it's only you only need to do it if you actually care enough about these minor differences between the rounded rectangle and the true rectangle. And that sort of depends. Often you don't. It doesn't matter. Sometimes it does. And I think this is another account in a bit more detail of... Uh, yeah, of how to do that. So again, something you could read through if you wanted to get a bit of a better idea about how to deal with the difficult cases. Um, there's some logic in here that helps with that, if you're so inclined. Yeah. Uh, of course, in the case of the stuff we were doing with Pong, we were just treating it as a really simple case. We were just treating it as point against line, which again is, is often tolerable. It just depends on how big your... Uh, how big your objects are. And uh, yeah, sometimes rotating rectangles are useful. I'm not going to talk about that here, but just so you know the term, th those are called oriented bounding boxes. And if you go and look at the literature and you want to find out how to detect collision with an OBB, that would explain these cases here. Okay, so this is pretty much the end of part one now. So I'm going to do some checking to make sure that this has not been a complete failure and you can maybe start tell me on IRC if it's been okay, then I will stop this stream and set up a new one for part two. Uh, and, you know, we might survive to the end of this. Okay, let me just go back and review my Hangout window. Right, 
some stuff in there. Let's go and have a look at the chat room. Um, but I'm a little bit ahead of you. I'll just put something in the chat to try and get people to confirm that they're still with me. Apparently I've got 20 viewers mm, out of the class of uh, 80. Yeah, well, the usual. Okay, people are saying that it's been good, so hopefully it was uh, a tolerable experience. Um, don't think of anything else I absolutely have to say. So I will stop this broadcast and then hopefully within a few minutes there'll be another one. I'll put links on the Facebook page because it won't be the same URL, just so you can all join in again. Bye for the moment.